Hello, everybody. This is Jacob Stoops, host of the Page Two Podcast. And as I've said, today is the day where I turn the spotlight on myself and for someone who doesn't like to be the center of attention and who is currently locked away in his office talking to himself. Uh, this is going to be a little bit weird for me, but I'm just asking others to share their stories and journeys. So I only felt that it would be uh, only right uh, for me to eventually turn it around and share my own uh, my own journey, my own thoughts um, and experiences, so on and so forth. But before I do that, I want to thank all of the amazing guests who've already come on uh, for episodes one through nine. We've spent tons of time, literally hours, often late at night after they've already worked their day jobs and, and we've talked shop and discussed life and I'm just really grateful for their willingness to be so open, uh, open and honest and candid and uh, forthcoming uh, with their knowledge and with their experience. And not only that, uh, I never thought that I would ever want to do a podcast, let alone get one up and running. Um, never thought I would do it, never thought I could get it up and running, which is a lot of work by the way. I never imagined that I'd get even one episode past the finish line, let alone let alone get to my 10th episode. Um, I've gotten some great feedback to this point, and it seems like folks are actually interested and not bored in the premise of the podcast. Uh, and I honestly, I really wasn't sure if there was room for another SEO podcast and and. Um, furthermore, one that doesn't necessarily focus on the knowledge sharing component, sharing all the knowledge, um, you know, as kind of the primary reason for doing it. Um, my reason for doing it is because of knowing my background and hearing the background of other people. Um, I just find that interesting. I feel like that's where the where the good stuff is, and I really want to. I, I want to knowledge share and I want to talk about, you know, life as well. And I want to talk about the the intersection of life and SEO. Life is an SEO. Um, and I want to get deep on uh, a number of a number of subjects and I want to get personal um, and I want to share. I want to share knowledge. I want to share experience. I want to do all that. Um, but I'm I know that I have a lot of experience, but I also know in my heart that there are better SEOs out there than me. Better professionals, probably, right? Uh, more experience, better at their job, more creative, whatever. Uh, and those are the people that I that I want to talk to in the industry, uh, whether it be people that are well-known uh, or people that aren't well-known. There are just so many great people and so many great um, SEOs, and I'm just really interested in talking to as many as I can, uh, documenting their stories, diving deep, like I said, talking about life, talking about SEO. Uh, and there's just, I think, so much opportunity there. Um, as I was kind of thinking about the premise of this podcast in particular, because there are already a number of podcasts out there on the subject, I had to think, all right, if I'm going to do a podcast, if I'm going to add another voice into the mix, um, what is my unique uh, what is my unique selling point? Why would I do it? Why would somebody want to listen to it? And for me, um, if you're going to do an SEO podcast, you have to share knowledge, right? So that's a given. Um, but for me, my unique kind of feature was I want to flip that on its head and I want to focus on the other stuff, the people aspect uh, of this. Um, and that's where I'm trying to dig in. And that's what I'm going to share today. I'm going to share a lot of really deep stuff about myself Um some stuff that probably even the people closest to me don't know. Uh, and I'm really going to kind of give you a lot of my unfiltered thoughts about SEO and about the things uh, that have happened in my life and my career leading me to this point. Um, but but before I do that, I uh, just wanted to say, again, thank you to everybody. Uh, there's more interviews to come and more content to come. Uh, and I really hope that you guys uh, enjoy it, but let's get started with my story. So who am I? Who am I at my core? Who is Jacob Stoops? And I hate to <laughs> hate to talk about myself in the in the third person, but uh, just did it. Um, <laughs> uh, I am uh, first and foremost, I am a family guy, not to be confused with the with the show, but um, for me, in terms of life priority, there's nothing more important to me 
uh, than being uh, being part of my family. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is I have a beautiful wife who I've been married to for seven years now, uh, seven consecutive years, and she is um, she's completely awesome. Uh, she is a school teacher, uh, and man, who. She has a tough job. She has a much tougher job than I do every single day of the week. Uh, and she is a seriously, seriously um, talented and amazing person. Great mother. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I have two kids. Uh, I have one on the way uh, coming here in a, in a few months. I've got a little boy, Carter, a little girl, Eliana. Uh, Carter is five. He's in kindergarten. Ellie is three, not yet in preschool. Uh, and they are they're just amazing. Uh, and, and I guess if I had to think about like my priorities in life overall, it would be um, being a dad, being a husband and um, being a good family member. And then, you know, things like work and, and, and so on and so forth. Love my love my job. But uh, definitely it's a it's a means means to an end. Um, how did I meet my wife? Uh, I met my wife in a date contest, date contest, um, which it's a, it's a long, long, long story. I'll try to, um, I'll try to do it some justice here. Um, but essentially, gosh, now like 10 years ago, um, I was working at, uh, kind of my first marketing job, uh, called your marketing corner. Uh, and, uh, my boss, Eric Leslie, who later became a groomsman in my, in my wedding, um, he knew that I was uh, very, very, very single at the time. Um, and your marketing corner had an office, in it, and it's a defunct business now. Uh, the premise was a walk-in marketing retail shop, and it unfortunately was a complete disaster and a complete failure. But for me, it was actually a good career opportunity because I got to learn um learn marketing and, and learn how to build websites. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But I was very, 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 very single. Um, and my boss knew it. And um, at the time, he was very involved with the local business uh, association, the, the uh, historic Dublin Business Association with uh, the person who was running that uh, was Tim Pichano, who is actually now my father-in-law. Didn't know it at the time. Um, Tim Pichano and um, part of what they were doing uh, was uh, uh, something called Slancha Thursday, right? So Slancha means uh, thank you in, uh, I believe it's Irish. Um, Irish, yeah, I, I think that's a language. Uh, Gaelic, something like that. And uh, if you're not familiar with Dublin, Ohio, Dublin, Ohio is huge when it comes to uh, celebrating the the Irish ethnicity. I believe uh, if you haven't heard of it, the Dublin Irish Festival is the second largest Irish festival in the world. They do it every year. It's a pretty amazing thing. But anyways, uh, so so uh, driving business down to the Dublin Historic District was something that at the time they were struggling with. There are a lot of small shops down there and uh, entrepreneurs and small business owners and um, constantly trying to think of ways to get more people into the district. And one of those ways uh, was uh, Slauncher Thursday, which was the brainchild of, of uh, my boss, Eric, and my future father-in-law, Tim. Uh, and so they had, they had put on an event the, the month before I became kind of entangled in it, and it was somewhat successful. And the, um, the following month, they kind of needed to put on another event. And this just so happens to be around the time the movie Sex and the City was coming out. Uh, so way back in kind of the mid 2000s. And um, it just so happens that the stars aligned. I was single at the time. Sex and the City was coming out and they decided that uh, in addition to several other themes, they were going to make uh, a good portion of this sex in the city related to bring people down. And part of that was a date contest. And because I was single, I was the guinea pig, right? I was the, um, I was the person, the person who was up for grabs for, um, for all of the, all of the, the ladies. 
so on and so forth, um, which sounds sounds super conceited, but I didn't really have a choice uh, in the matter. My boss basically said, you're you're doing this. Um, so we get there, right? We, we get to the event and we, we're, we're holding this event next door, um, next door to the, to the little uh, quote unquote retail shop where we work at. And um, to be completely honest, I was so nervous that I, I, had to, I had to drink. It was like Raj from Big Bang Theory, right? Um, I just have a, a, a great deal of social anxiety. And especially when I get into large groups, I get nervous. So I, from about 1 p.m. on that day, started uh, slowly but surely giving myself drinks, liquid courage, so on and so forth. Uh, and when the, when the time finally came, uh, uh, apparently they had set up for, for, for women uh, to come in and for me to interview them. Uh, and I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, and apparently they had not planned to deliver these, these ladies down to the district. They expected it to be more of a walk-up thing. And that kind of didn't really, really happen. And in total, uh, I think three total people, one of which ended up being my wife, ended up being game for the quote unquote interview, which was super, super awkward. And um, anyways, um, my, my, my wife, uh, she wasn't planning to come down, but her dad said, hey, we need some people down here. Can you bring uh, you and your girlfriends uh, down to the district? There's this win a date with Jake thing. Um, and again, he didn't know me at the time. He had no idea who I was. Uh, but there's this win a date with Jake thing and my wife being kind of just open, open um, and, and kind of a fun loving person said, sure, what the hell? So she came down. I, I very awkwardly interviewed uh, three young ladies, all of which were very nice. At the end, um, I said, you know what? Uh, I pick I picked Gina. I, I, I don't know. There was just something something about her, about her um, uh, openness and willing to kind of play along that kind of put me at ease. I, I, I really can't say anything other, other than that. Other, I mean, obviously, she was, to me, beautiful. Um, but that's that part was neither here nor there. It was more about just the comfort level with her at that point in time. Um, anyways, fast forward to the, the actual date. And that in and of itself is kind of a story. Um, we had planned to go one place and unfortunately the location of the date got changed by my boss at the last second. My father-in-law owns restaurants. He owns a restaurant in the historic district, which is why he's involved in the historic district anyways. Um, and the date got changed to his restaurant, which in and of itself isn't necessarily a, a bad thing, right? Um, but the date got changed to his restaurant on the day that Gina's entire family, brothers, neighbors, and, and, and everyone were planning to be there to watch a, a, a live band who was performing at the restaurant. And I got noticed late and I was like, you know what? Oh man, this sounds like it's going to be terrible. Let's just get it over with. I didn't really tell Gina, but I was, I, when Gina called me and said, mm, it looks like the date got switched. Um, I was very curt on the phone and I said, fine, let's just do it. And I went there and uh, initially it was awkward. I was super nervous. I believe I actually, and this is completely unlike me, I ordered a salad, which I never do. Uh, and she ordered like a full meal, ate the entire thing. I took two bites of my salad. Um, so I was super nervous. But throughout the night, um, one, alcohol helped. Um, but two, um, we just really got on and got along. And her family being there didn't end up actually being that big of an issue. They were really nice and really respectful. They kept their distance, even though there were like 80 of them there. And eventually we talked and, and we had a great time. And um, there was a there was kind of a moment and my wife laughs at this like she doesn't really think much of it. But there was a, a moment where I had to I had to go to the bathroom. And when I when I got up to go to the bathroom, I um, she did she did this thing where she kind of just like put her hand on my back or my shoulder and and I don't know it, it was just very comforting and um, so it, I mean of course I went to the bathroom came back and but I but I remembered that and it was just like 
for for me, I hadn't had a, a ton of luck. I'd been in some long term relationships before, but not necessarily a ton of luck with you know finding the right person. And for me, like something about that gesture, it just fit. It just fit. I was like, what? Well, she she's kind of a comforting and caring person. Or I don't I don't know. I I don't even know why I even read into it, but. That's neither here nor there. We had a great time. I asked her out um, again, and um, the relationship blossomed blossomed from there. Um, two years, uh, two years later, three years later, we got engaged and eventually got married. And we've been married for seven years, and we've got two kids and uh, beautiful family, a dog, and and uh, a house, and everything's great. But yeah, um, that's our that's our. Our, um, our dating story, it is so completely, completely unique um, and completely different from any story I've ever, ever heard. And it's almost like a movie. So it's hard for me to do justice to it. I know I'm, <laughs> I know it's like a 10 minute story, but it's really hard for me to do justice without going into um, all of the, the details of, of it. But outside of that, in terms of who I am, um, if you don't know anything about me, I... I love mob movies. I, I, I'm a history history buff. Um, on the wall right behind me in my office, I have a picture of uh, uh, The Godfather, some custom artwork, The Godfather, Godfather 2, Casino, Goodfellas. Love, love mob. I don't know why I love mob movies. I just think that um, crime drama and, um, and being a history buff uh, kind of intersects. And I just think it's, um, I think it's really cool. Um, I would say if I had to name um, top five movies, um, aside from The Godfather, some movies that you would um, that you would not expect. I love Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That to me is a is an awesome movie that I find hilarious um, every time I watch it. Um, recently, The Greatest Showman, I would say, uh, has moved into my top five. Surprisingly, I never expected it when I started watching it. And uh, I'll talk about my my man crush on Hugh Jackman um, a little bit later, and I'll talk about I'll talk about how I feel like that song or not that song, but that sh- movie um, when I watched it helped to snap me out of my um, out out of depression, um, which is it's a weird 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 connection. Um, gosh, another underrated movie that I love, The Other Guys you haven't seen the other guys it is a movie about two two cops uh will ferrell i know some people think will ferrell's funny other people know not so much and mark Wahlberg. and mark Wahlberg is shockingly funny and will ferrell's doing his will ferrell bit and it's um it's really funny there's so many um so many great one-liners it's completely underrated a lot of people haven't heard of it but i think that that movie is hilarious and for those of you that have watched it i almost got into a car wreck the other day where somebody um, somebody was uh, approaching kind of an off ramp and decided at the last second that they were going to not get off at the off ramp and they pulled back into my lane and um, honestly if I had tried to slam on my brakes I would have run right into him with my entire family in the car so it was one of those really scary your life flashes before your eyes sorts of moments but I feel like I'm a pretty good driver so I calmly Drove around them, uh, hit the gas, did what I needed to do, got around them. We we didn't get in an accident, laid on the horn a little bit. But if you've seen the movie The Other Guys, you'll know that there is a very funny scene um, where they're getting chased uh, by um, some terrorists, some bad guys. And the bad guy says, looks like somebody's been uh, playing Grand Theft Auto. So my first, the first words out of myself after this um, when everybody in the car is completely shaken up was look like somebody's been playing Grand Theft Auto. Only I laughed. My wife didn't think it was funny, but I thought it was super funny. A um, couple of other things about me. Uh, if you don't know, um, I, I'm a singer. Uh, I've always been a singer. Um, I sing uh, pretty regularly. If you actually want to hear me sing, I'm not going to do it now. Uh, you can see a few examples on my website's about page, jacobstoops.com forward slash about. Um, but I've, as, as since I guess I was young, I've always just been a, able to, to be a fair singer. And it's something that I've um, kind of carried with me into adulthood. It's not something that I talk a lot. Like I said, I'm not very self-promotional. 
I'm not a singer on the level of like a professional singer and even some professional singers aren't good singers anyways. Um, but I'm better than average. I'm better than average. And it's something that I'm proud of. Um, my wife and I, my wife, another reason that she's a great fit for me is she's also a singer. Uh, and we do, and we've done for many years, uh, regularly, we didn't do it this year because we've got a baby on the way and she's taking some college courses, but, um, we pretty regularly sing at an ovarian cancer benefit called the Movement Mission. You can look it up, um, and it's it's a, a really great um, uh, organization. Uh, and every year we put on a show uh, in the dance studio that my wife used to go to and then used to work at in college puts it on and it's a combination of music and dancing and every year um, you know we try to uh, go there and perform uh, to raise money for uh, ovarian cancer awareness and cancer awareness to me is something um, something that's very important um, I've lost some loved ones to cancer and it's a very very terrible thing um, but that's neither here nor there uh, the other thing and I feel like this thing is more a part of my SEO story is that I am a fair, um, a fair artist and a fair, fair drawer. I just have a uh, an ability. Uh, I believe it comes from my dad, who is also really good at that. Um, and I've always been able to uh, draw things really well. I don't do it now as much as I would like, um, but it is definitely something that if I had not done it, I would not be an SEO today. And I'll explain that um, connection in a little bit. Um, I would say the other things about me. Um, when I was in high school, I was an athlete, uh, football player, two-time football captain, track athlete, um, played basketball, baseball, you know, whatever, pretty much played all sports. Um, I wanted to go to college to play football, uh, had some early scholarship offers, which unfortunately dried up when I tore not one, but two of my ACLs. So I am the uh, mid-30s guy with creaky knees, uh, still trying to get out there and and uh, relive my glory days, but unfortunately my knees uh, just will not allow me to do that. Um, I come from a small town uh, called Crestline, Ohio. Uh, it is, um, I would say, a very conservative place, very small. I think my town had 5,000 people. We were always in the, um, in the lowest division sports-wise, um, it was good. It was great. Um, you know, I moved to Columbus to go to to go to college, um, and I liked it. I like being here. I'm I'm a small town person in a big city, but I like the the amount of options and you know things like the the recession uh, and uh, a lot of other things have kind of hit my town and the area that I'm from pretty hard economically. Um, so just for people there, for some people it's great. Um, for me, I just felt boxed in, which is why I'm why I'm not there any anymore, and why I moved, uh, and why I live in Columbus, I live in Columbus, Ohio. Um, in terms of my my childhood, uh, and this is something again I don't tell or talk to many people about it, but it is a big part of who I am and um, things that I go through and am still going through. Not going to say. Um, where this came from, but in my childhood, I, I was abused. Um, it is hard to talk about, um, both physically and, and emotionally. Um, went through five divorces, which was, um, as a kid, really, really, really hard. And I think the the traits in my personality that come from that, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the sanctity of marriage, obviously, somebody um, coming from from that type of a situation, um, a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of people as they grow up that that see their parents do that and that fall back in, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, and when you see your parents do that, you think that it's okay. Um, and I'm not trying to judge anybody, um, but for me, when I saw that and when I saw what I I perceived at the time to be mistakes by my parents. Now that I'm older, I realized that those relationships were just never meant to be. Um, but as a kid, going through five divorces and so much upheaval and change, um, it was really difficult. And I firmly believe, I don't believe in divorce because of that. Um, not to say that 
divorce is not the right um, decision for people and everybody has their their own be- belief set. Um, but as for me and my wife, um, we both, uh, especially for the benefit of our kids, just don't believe in divorce, nor do I want to get divorced or anything like anything like that. We're very happy. Um, you know, we, we certainly go through our tiffs from time to time, but we're very happy. Um, and, and I just don't want my kids to ever grow up thinking um, the way that I thought about it, which was, um, I don't want to do that. I, as a kid, I was thinking, I don't want to do that to my kids because it really sucks. And you never feel like you're wanted. Uh, and when you add um, some of the abuse uh, in, you know, physical and emotional that kind of goes on top of that, what it led to for me, things that I'm still dealing with today are, I think a lot of, um, a lot of psychological issues, right? And I feel like I'm a, I'm a fairly level-headed person, but there are there are times where this this comes right back up, whether it be um, you know temper-related or where I just feel kind of a great sadness when I remember something from my from my childhood. I think there are times when I have a chip on my shoulder. Um, you know, coming from a small town, um, I lived in a trailer growing up and I got made fun of a lot for that. Um, so there's a certain chip on my shoulder and a certain um, feeling of you're not good enough. And and for me, that has always kind of driven me to be as good as I can be. Um, I've always gravitated, no matter where I've been in my life, to a leadership position. And part of that has been because of this upbringing and this feeling that I need to pull myself up by the bootstraps, uh, and and unfortunately sometimes it's a bit of a devil on my shoulders um, where I feel like I'm not I'm not good enough, and that pushes me to be better. And it's sometimes it's incredibly incredibly unhealthy, and sometimes I can't help it. But um, it's something that I'm working on. Um, my wife and I have spent a lot of time working on that. Um, yeah, it's you know, nobody's perfect, um, and and that is certainly one of my personality traits that I'm sure anybody who's worked with me has probably, um, if they're listening to this, can be like, yeah, but that makes sense. That that fits. Um, that fits, and I I hope that it hasn't um, caused you know a detrimental working relationship with anybody if any of that is has come out. But it's just it's part of who I am. So. Moving on, um, how did I get into SEO? Um, I did kind of tease um, the art connection, right? So I came up as a kid, really good at art, uh, kind of excelled. When I got to be a teenager, I kind of, I still had that ability, but I didn't really care about it as much. I cared about sports. Um, but when it got time to go to college, um, I, I wanted to, to be a graphic designer. So I went to Ohio State. First, I started off in OSU Mansfield before ultimately going down to Ohio State, uh, the Columbus campus, the big one that everybody knows, um, as a graphic design student. And it was awesome. I loved being in Columbus and I loved um, I loved going to Ohio State. But I will say at that point in time, I was incredibly, incredibly unfocused. Uh, And not only that, college is expensive. And because I grew up poor and I came from a small town um, and unfortunately, you know, my parents just didn't have the resources to put me through college. I had to put myself through college, um, which meant that I had, um, in addition to being from a small town and moving to Columbus, Ohio, when you've never experienced that before, I also had to find a job. Uh, So my job was at UPS. And I went to UPS only because they offered tuition assistance. And uh, UPS is is an interesting, interesting place. Um, And I take pride on my ability to be a hard worker. And UPS is a really, really, really hard job. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, A pretty rigid, rigid schedule. So I would go to class all day. And then uh, I would have to be in for my shift. I worked the um, the evening shift. I would have to be in there. Um, typically, leave leave school, go all the way out to what was called West Campus, where you catch the bus um, to my car and take my car all the way into um, UPS. You get there five five fifteen. You get out at nine ten, sometimes eleven o'clock at night. And then you come home and have to study in this job. Um, 
if you <laughs> the best way I can describe it because I was a I was a package loader to begin with is imagine 2,000 over the course of three to four hours, 2,000 boxes, 50 pounds each, coming down a conveyor belt nonstop that you have to load into the back of a truck and you have to keep going and keep going and keep going. Uh, and the conditions in the truck, especially in the summer, are it's 110, 120 degrees in the truck in the summer. It is probably 40 degrees in the truck in the winter. And you've got your supervisor in your door riding your ass the entire time. So for me, it was good because it gave me a chance to get the tuition assistance. But it was damn hard. Damn hard. Um, but I, I ended up working there for four years, and um, it was good that I had a steady job because that meant that I had a little bit of money. It was bad in the sense that because I had that job, I did not get enough time to focus, nor was I inclined to come home and focus enough on school. And in addition to kind of wanting at that time being a young guy and wanting to get out and um, experience life a little bit, I would say that I uh, the the combination of all of those factors uh, led me to party my way, work my way, whatever my way out of school. So eventually I had to had to drop out. And um, that sucked. That really sucked because uh, what came with that was a lot of a, a lot of debt, a lot of debt. And I, and I and after I dropped out, I was I was still working at UPS. Um, I tried a few more times uh, with school tried uh, to go to Columbus State um, and, uh, you know, tried to come back to Ohio State for a few classes. And it just never quite worked out, never worked out at Ohio State um, or Columbus State for me. And I piled up a lot of debt. So I had to keep my job. And um, eventually I, I, you know, I was working at UPS. I became a supervisor. Like I said, I gravitate towards leadership. That was a leadership position. Uh, when I got to, um, to be a supervisor, I, I got to make a little bit more money, but the problem was what I didn't realize at the time was that when you go at UPS from being a, a, a regular worker um, protected by the union, you, when you become a supervisor, you're not unionized anymore. And that is a big problem where they work, unfortunately, um, to the point where if you're a supervisor and a union employee catches you touching a package, you get written up and you if you do that too much you could even get fired um, so no matter how bad uh, the packages are being damaged or how bad things are blowing up or how slowly the union employees might be moving you touch that package you risk getting um, getting a union a union person up your ass um, and and not only that but I had a I had a really tough boss at the time who did not like me very much so I lasted by the time you know from the time that I got into um, Ohio State when I got the job uh, to the time when I finally walked in to UPS and I've never quit anything in my life and said I can't take it anymore I quit I didn't even give them notice I said I quit today uh, walked right into my boss's office I've never done it before never done it since didn't give them notice and said I am done I didn't have um, didn't have a backup plan didn't have a backup plan um, but at that point in time sometimes you just reach your tipping point right and you can't do it anymore so that was my backup. That, uh, that, that, was, that, was, that was kind of my reckoning uh, in my life, right? Time to get my shit together. Um, and so from there, I, I knew, I, all right, I got to get a job again. Um, I reached out to, to my best friend who was working at, of all places, Petland, uh, of all places. Um, so I said, sure, sign me up. I'll go work at Petland. Uh, and by the way, I want to work seven days a week. And then I said, okay, that's not enough money. So I got a second job. At Staples, uh, which if you love The Office, when Dwight went to work at Staples, it was freaking hilarious to me and I could w relate on a completely different level. Um, anyhow, that was kind of the turning point in my life. I had not yet met my wife, right? And um, I, I, I worked at between Petland and Staples every day seven days a week without having a day off for three straight months and only a handful of days off over the course of about eight months. And that wore me into the ground, wore me into the ground. I just became kind of a nub, a zombie of a person. And uh, 
what eventually transpired from then was kind of a, a reckoning in my mind, like I got to do something with my life, got to do something with my life. So at that point in time, again, this is why I believe whether it's God or somebody else, pe- somebody or something puts people in your life um, for a reason. And, and at that point in time, I just happened to be dating somebody, um, a long-term girlfriend, and her best friend was dating somebody else. And that somebody else uh, ended up being Eric Leslie, who um, ended up becoming a groomsman, but who at that time I didn't know very well. And he he knew my situation, and he said one day, why don't you come work for me? Uh, and he worked at, um, at a place called Cornerstone Local. So I went in and interviewed. I had no skills. Um, and the Cornerstone Local was kind of a weird business model. On one side of the business, they, they were um, the, the people that do cold calling, telemarketing, that fill conference events. And on the other side, they did um, local search marketing. Really weird combination. Um, But they started me off on the telemarketing side. And honestly, within three weeks, I proved that I was the worst telemarketer ever. Um, The type of telemarketer that that calls you at dinner time and gets so nervous on the phone when you start yelling at me that I hang up on you. That's a true story. Um, and so my friend, luckily, luckily he was nice and and he pulled me aside and he said, look, man, here, you're not doing so well on this side of the business. So, um, we need somebody on the other side of the business. It's search marketing and we need somebody, uh, we're building a lot of websites. Uh, and at that point in time, they were using, using WordPress. So this is about, uh, 2006, um, 2006. And he said, if you can teach yourself how to build websites and if you can leverage your graphic design background, that's the connection, um, you can have a job. Otherwise, sorry, um, we're going to have to move on. So the first thing I did, and this is an odd thing given that it's um, digital, right? It's all online. Um, But at that time, it wasn't. Um, I went to Barnes & Noble. I picked up uh, a book. Uh, that you can still get today, although I wouldn't recommend a book to learn HTML called uh, CSS and HTML for Beginners. Um, I forget the brand of the book. And in about a week, I read it cover to cover. And then I started playing around with uh, at work and, and implementing some of the things that I had learned. And before I knew it, started building websites. Now, granted, they weren't pretty websites. They weren't, they weren't great websites, and we had another really great guy who was working there at the time um, who I'm really thankful for. His name is Aaron Flax. Um, he doesn't do marketing anymore, but he did at the time, and he, um, he knew a ton at the time, and he was willing to share all of that knowledge with me and to pass it forward, um, and he helped me out a ton. My boss, Eric, helped me out a ton. He knew just enough to be dangerous and he was kind of a good high level strategic thinker. And anyways, we started building websites, right? We built uh, hundreds, hundreds of websites. We built websites for US companies, for Latin American companies, so on and so forth. I got the opportunity to um, to learn how WordPress works in and out, to get technical experience, to build a bunch of websites, um, to design a bunch of websites. Now granted, they did not look good judging by today. Um, but for me, it was exactly what I needed. Now, the flip side of that was I was not getting paid a lot of money at the time. There were weeks where I would um, I would get my paycheck and I would say, all right, here's my paycheck. And then I would, uh, on a piece of paper, write down all my bills. And even before I had spent a single penny in my paycheck, my bills exceeded my paycheck. <laughs> Um, that's a problem, right? Um, so I had to figure something out. And for me, for a while, it was, all right, let's figure out which bills I'm going to pay because I was dirt poor. I had no help. Um, big, big problem. So for me, um, I honestly, I just decided to dive because I was single at the time. Um, I had since broken up with my girlfriend. I was single at the time. Dive head first into learning uh, learning web design. And the deeper I got into it, the more I started to um, understand things like analytics and get interested in traffic. And the more I got into that, the more I said, all right, we're building all these websites and they're not getting any traffic. Why is that? And um, that's when I discovered SEO. 
Uh, and that's honestly when I kind of fell in love and when I started um, started to learn that, hey, um, there's more to um, there's more to building websites and marketing than I than I ever knew about. And the industry was um, was so it wasn't new. Right. There have been people that have been doing it for 20, 20 years, 20 plus years. Right. But it was new to me. Um, and I thought, all right. I don't have a college degree. I don't have um, the traditional things that people who get good jobs have. But for me, I recognized the opportunity and I said, all right, I don't know a single other SEO. I don't. And I did not uh, Now I do. Luckily, I don't know a single other SEO. This is something that I can do that can make me stand out from a career perspective. So I dove in and I did and learned as much as I could. Uh, and eventually another one of those fate things happened. Uh, my roommate at the time, um, uh, who is actually my, my best friend's brother, happened to know a guy um, named Steve White. Uh, Steve White uh, right now owns his own automotive, automotive company. But Steve at the time was working at a place called People to My Site. And People to My Site is a small marketing shop. It's now called The Shipyard. Um, it's it's undergone kind of a, a rebranding and a transformation, but at the time it was a small marketing shop um, based in Gahanna, Ohio, which is a suburb of Columbus, and and they were looking for people to do SEO. Uh, and uh, lucky enough, uh, Steve and Steve and Steve went to church together, and uh, my roommate at the time mentioned to Steve White that hey. Uh, my my roommate's been doing a lot of SEO, and we connected. Uh, and Steve Steve called me literally the the day after the day after I had met him, and offered me a job at People to My Site, and um, and I took it because it was more money, uh, opportunity to get an SEO career started, uh, and that was kind of my taking taking off point for for my SEO career, my jumping off point. Um, so my time at People to My Site was awesome, right? Um, so I so I got to work with a really cool person. Her name is Julie Brown, um, who and they were doing a lot of really cool things. Um, but really, what it was great for me for was to be kind of a a training ground, right? A place where without a ton of scrutiny that I could learn and that I could test and um, put into practice some of the things that I had been reading about um, from people like. Rand Fishkin, right, um, or or Maz, SEO Moz at the time, um, or other people, uh, the Matt Cuts of the world, right. So, um, got an opportunity to to really get in and start working and honing my craft. And um, throughout my time there, I was there for four years. Um, got the opportunity to work with some really cool brands, Scott's Miracle Grow. Got to work with Lexus. Got to work with the Arnold Sports Festival, which was pretty cool. Um, and some other really cool brands, um, mostly smaller brands, uh, mostly uh, you know small mom and pop shops. And over the course of time, um, what actually happened is, uh, unfortunately, my, my boss Julie left, and that left me at a at a young age um, to be the director of SEO, right? And I was way too young to be a director of anything. I now realize that, but for me, at my career, I was like, holy crap, I'm I'm doing something, right? I'm 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 making moves. Um, and, uh, really I just got, I just got lucky because of, because of circumstances, but gave me an opportunity to, to really do some cool things. And, um, and I got to a point there where I, I, I was there for, I believe two and a half or three years. And eventually I just got to the point where from a career standpoint, I felt like I, my head was coming out of the roof. I felt like I had reached my ceiling, but before I reached my ceiling, they had started to shift as a business. Um, to focusing more on franchises. And um, we got an opportunity that I thought was really cool before I left, and they've since kind of finished it off and perfected it and have done some really cool things with it, um, to build a custom content management system and a custom system to where businesses, uh, franchise businesses who are, are busy running their business and they don't have time to think about their website, right? We built them a system where they could literally come in in an hour, um, get a domain name, 
populate all of their service information like hey this is who I am this is my address this is what I do these are the types of services that I offer these are the localities that I serve here are some pictures of my store so on and so forth plug in all that information and within an hour or a day it would spit out a dynamically optimized website for their business um, and we built it so that it could move almost because franchises have a lot of franchises or, or, or uh, com these companies that do franchising have a lot of business owners that need websites. Um, we built a system that at the time could spit out uh, a small business website that was at least somewhat not terribly optimized um, that they could use and that they could market uh, that they didn't have to worry about. And um, I remember, and this is it's funny because it it relates to my experience at Search Discovery. There was a developer there named Sean Hill, uh, who now, or he doesn't work for Search Discovery anymore. I believe he moved on, but he did for uh, some point. So that connection actually helped me get my job at Search Discovery because while I was at People to My Site, I was literally leaning over Sean's shoulder, going, "Do this, do this, do this." With respect to the SEO components, um, obviously he built he built the entire system, but. Um, it was really, really cool to um, to put that strategy together, and it's really cool how they're um, continuing to use it. And I think that they've pivoted a couple of times, but that's kind of where where I left it. And for me, kind of the next stepping stone was uh, an automotive dealership group. I, I was able to leverage my experience uh, working with Lexus, uh, which was kind of a trip, um, into working with an automotive dealership group here in Columbus, um, pretty well known. Uh, at least here locally, Germain. Uh, and Germain at that time was owned by two brothers, uh, Rick and Steve, and uh, Rick Germain himself. Uh, they were looking for somebody to help them with marketing. They didn't um, they didn't know a lot about marketing and the internet and so on and so forth, and they needed somebody to come on. I was looking for some someplace else to go. And for me, it, it was just a fit. I, you know, I had put my, um, put my resume out there, I believe on Career Builder or Monster or someplace they found it. And uh, it was a fit for me, both career as a career stepping stone and um, salary, right? It was good salary. So, so I made the jump. Uh, and there, I, I wanted to, to take an opportunity to step back from SEO and to be a little bit more holistic. So I did get the opportunity to do that. Um, but I didn't stay there for very, very long. And, and what I will say about it is um, it just wasn't a great fit. And I would say that certain things that you think about dealerships are, in fact, accurate. And it wasn't a great fit um, for me. And I knew it almost immediately. Um, the first day that I went there, my boss at the time, their very first thing for me to do was install a printer. And I was like... Well, I'm not an IT guy. I don't. I, you probably know how to do this better than me. But my first job at Jermaine, the new digital marketing director, install our printer, and uh, so things like that kept kind of happening. And and then there was a, a day where um, Rick came came to me, and and um, you know I I don't want to like speak bad or anything like that. But there was a belief that um, newspaper ads could sell more cars than Auto Trader. And I and and then what I was doing, and uh, I just I got the sense that I was not long for that world, and um, I've never been fired, um, and I and I was doing a good job, right? We had built a bunch of new websites, we had we had gotten their websites onto platforms that made their site design better, um, we had grown grown leads and grown traffic and so on and so forth, and I was doing a lot of cool things. I got into some video work, which was pretty awesome. Um, but I just, I knew at that moment, like, okay, this isn't going to work. And luckily, again, fate, um, Ed Zatusky, who was at that point in time, a recruiter for Rosetta. Honestly, I'm not even sure how he found me. I forget, I forget how we made the connection, but he reached out to me. Um, he was from Rosetta and, uh, I took the opportunity to, to move there. Um, and that's how I moved to Rosetta, which I ended up staying at Rosetta for many, um, many years. And uh, it was a good it was a good change for me. I decided my passion is SEO. Um, I, it was pretty cool to do the holistic thing, but even cooler to dive in and be an SEO. Right. Um, 
So, so I got to Rosetta, and, and not only that, I should profess my love for Cleveland, Ohio. So one of the, one of the um, criteria for the job was that I would have to work in um, Cleveland from time to time. So it gave me an excuse to go up to Cleveland. Cleveland's an awesome place. Um, I know it doesn't have the best reputation nationally, but it's an awesome place. Um, so I got to go there, and I got to meet a lot of really new people. And what I will say, um, when I first started there, the people... I was so intimidated, right? Because people were so smart and there were so many of them. And I was so used to being an SEO on a small team. And the best way that I can describe my time getting to Rosetta was that it was the first time in my life, in my career professionally, where I was like, these people get me. Uh, there's finally, like, I, I, you know, I could sit up from my desk and look around. And as far as the eye could see in our office was nothing but SEOs. There had to be 40 of them. Um, on staff at that point in time, maybe more, maybe 50. I don't know. I, don't, I never counted. Um, but it was SEOs as far as the eye could see. And um, it was really cool to be with a group of people who were not only smart, but that got me and that got my passion and got where I was coming from. And um, Rosetta, you know, especially at that point in my career was a great place for me. And I was hired um, to, to work on a really big brand here in Columbus. I think that I'm far enough away that I can say it now, Nationwide Insurance. Uh, Nationwide at the time was, um, you know, working with a pretty big engagement with Rosetta. It was the biggest SEO, SEO client. And, um, you know, the, the, the great thing about it is because it was such a big client, um, there were a lot of SEOs. It was a 20 person SEO team. And that's something that, that, um, that I've never in any other place seen replicated. I, and I did count the number of team members. It was 20 that worked on the nationwide account, which was amazing, but at the same time terrifying because I had never managed 20 people at one time ever. Um, and you know, to try to keep all of those plates spinning um, with, with resources ranging from really senior to really junior, um, was definitely a challenge. And I specifically, I was in Columbus. Most of the team was in Cleveland and I was hired to uh, for a special type of role. And the role was that Nationwide wanted somebody embedded from Rosetta with their digital team four days a week, downtown Columbus. And I was lucky enough to be chosen to do that. So for the first two years of my existence at Rosetta, it was the only account that I worked on and I was embedded sitting in the next cubicle over with nation from nationwide's digital team um, being kind of the liaison and then once a week i was traveling back to cleveland to work in person hands-on um, with the cleveland team and we continued that existence for quite a while and and um and don't get me wrong like they worked for nationwide the relationship with nationwide had been going on long before i got there and it had been very successful because of really smart people long before i got there but um when I got there, it was pretty deep into into the relationship, and we were growing things year over year. We had an SEO engagement, we had a paid engagement. Um, it was a lot of money coming in for Rosetta at the time, and it was by far the biggest the biggest SEO account, which is, as you'll find out in a minute, both good and um, and bad. So we were doing great work. We did a we did a really awesome. We worked with them on a really awesome redesign and replatform, and performance um, was doing really well and then they hired another cmo um and i i forget that person's name they're not there anymore um but they hired another cmo and uh you know we had been working with them for seven or eight years and they decided to rfp us which can be uh especially if you have an established relationship and you're not expecting it um and some of the people that i now work with at search discovery were there for it um, a lot of former Rosettians uh, at Search Discovery, but they decided to RFP us. And um, we were assured because of the quality of the relationship uh, and, the, and the results that we had been driving, we were assured that um, we weren't going anywhere throughout the entire process. So we didn't really have to go through kind of the typical RFP process in which we put together a um, you know huge deck and really pitch our services really hard um, and really go in and um, be aggressive like you would if you're coming in from the outside on fresh uh, fresh BD 
Um, so we, we did do some of that, right? But it, it definitely probably wasn't as on point as if we were the ones pitching and trying to win that massive piece of business. And a couple of things collided for me at that point in time. Um, and it's really kind of, kind of remarkable. Um, one, uh, my wife and I were pregnant. Uh, well, I wasn't pregnant, but my wife was pregnant with our son and, um, we're about two years into the nationwide relationship and, um, we're getting close to delivery, right? And this is all going on behind the scenes. And um, we get to a point um, where we wake up one day and we're not exactly sure what had happened because my, like sometimes with, with women, and this is kind of gross, when the water breaks, it's not like the movies, right? It's not like this big splash and it's, oh my God, we're having a baby. Um, we didn't really know what was going on, just that Basically, she was peeing herself, and, and I apologize, that's TMI, but that's what was happening. So we got up one morning, and it was a month before our due date, and that happened. Um, so we were like, oh, we better go to the hospital. We called the pediatrician, and the pediatrician said, go to the hospital right now. Um, well, I didn't even have my hospital bag packed. Um, we had just finished my son's nursery literally the night before, uh, not more than 12 hours before we had just put the finishing finishing touches, finish the paint, finish hanging the pictures. And we sat in it and said, all right, in a month, there's going to be a baby here. Went to the hospital and um, nobody was telling us anything. So the whole time I'm communicating back and forth with my bosses going, hey, I'm at the hospital. I'm not going to probably be in for a little while. I'm not sure what's going on. And eventually, like somebody finally told us, "Um, yeah, your water broke. You're having a baby today. Shock, complete shock. Um, so I, you know, I said, all right, I'm not going to be in, um, had, a, had our son, most amazing moment of my life. And, um, you know, after a couple of days in the hospital, we get home and, um, you know, I'm just kind of checking in on what's going on, right? Just checking in with life, checking in with work. I open my computer and I don't, again, fate, this keeps coming back to me, fate. The first email that came up in my inbox was the email from my boss saying, uh, unfortunately, Nationwide has decided to go a different direction and we have lost all media, all SEO. We'd been fired. And I sat there. I remember it like it was yesterday. I sat there at the island of my, um, uh, you know, in my kitchen. My wife was on the couch. We had this this little baby um just home, just home. Whew. And I did what I'm doing now. Um, I didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to do. So I sat in silence for 45 minutes before I had the heart to tell my wife what had happened. And um, eventually I called my boss and I said, all right, because I'm I, I, at that point in time, I was a remote employee, right? Uh, and I was embedded with the nationwide team, but the team was in Cleveland and I was in Columbus and I was the only Columbus employee. I was the Columbus branch of the Rosetta office. And I said, am I going to be fired? And they said, I don't know. That was hard. Um, they said, uh, we're looking at everything. We're trying to figure it out. Um, but, you know, to be completely honest, like it's likely that some people are going to be let go. So, all right, had to start putting my resume together again. Um sucked. It sucked. Um, I only got to go back and, and we had a good working relationship. I had some people it, nationwide that were really great people on their side of the fence. Um, and I only got to go back a couple more times. And when I went back into the office to pick up my stuff and clean out my desk, uh, honestly, they, they, hu- they, they hugged me and they were like, they were crying for me because they knew the, um, the situation. Um, so here I am, uh, new baby and about to not have a job. Luckily for me, unluckily for some other people, um, some firings had to happen. Some people uh, were let go. I was not one of them. Um, I got to go on in my in my Rosetta journey. Um, I moved on to some really great hospitality accounts. Um, one was Marriott, and again, I'm far enough away where I feel like I can talk about it. One was Marriott, and another was Ritz Carlton, and I worked on a few other accounts at the time. But I spent most of my time on on those two. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that's where things, I think, for me at Rosetta changed uh, a little bit. And I, I was lucky. I got to roll on to um, another really great account. But I was also sad because some of my other team members who were really awesome in their own right, through no fault of their own, had to be let go. Because when you have a giant account like that, and this is a lesson, I think, for if anybody is, is running an agency right now, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, Nationwide was a several million dollar account for us. And unfortunately, none of the other accounts, um, we had other great accounts, but none of them, um, none of them measured up to that. And when you have that and it goes away and you don't have a strong BD pipeline behind it, which we didn't, the only thing that can go is headcount. Um, and, and not only with our team, but we lost people from other teams that had nothing to do with it. Um, so that was unfortunate, and that's not the only time that I've gone through, uh, a, you know, a round of firings or a riff, and it's um, it's really hard. I will say, eventually, um, the the team there um, did their best to not cut headcount as much as possible, but unfortunately, when they um, made the initial cuts, they didn't cut deep enough. So six months later, we all had to go through it again. Um, and I, I remember my boss, Jason Tabling, whose unfortunate job it was to do a lot of that and make a lot of those decisions. Honestly, I remember him after it had happened and after the people had let go, been let go, um, you know, standing up in front of us, you know, honestly crying his eyes out going, you know, I, I wish that I, I, I wish that I didn't have to do this. And I wish that I would have just had the courage to pull the bandaid off in the beginning and let everybody go that we needed to let go. But I, I tried to hold out hope that maybe we would win more work so that we could keep more people than we had the budget and the capacity to do financially, but it just didn't work out. And six months later or something thereabout, we had to go through another round of, of layoffs, unfortunately. And uh, I will say that um, I was lucky enough, again, to know ahead of time that I was not being laid off. And I found that out on a Friday, uh, but I was also told that and I, my, my Cleveland days were Monday, um, and I would go up on Mondays. That's about a two, two-and-a-half-hour drive. So I was told that it was happening on Monday by my boss, but not to say anything. Um, so I drove up to Cleveland, and I knew that this was going to happen. And, um, you know, I walked into the office, and I knew it wasn't going to be a good day. And uh, the first, and I, again, fate the first five people that I spoke to and there was no particular reason we just happened to be crossing paths all let go and I I was just like what was I like the kiss of the kiss of death that day <laughs> um, and it was just so sad so sad the the first five people that I talked to all let go um, and again I was lucky enough to stay um, and to continue to continue on and uh, it was great. It was really great. Like that was, it was still a great company to work at. And what I will say, I, again, I don't want to badmouth the company. Um, eventually, we merged with Razorfish, right? Because Rosetta was part of the publicist group, um, and it's weird to say because they're all now competitors um, with with us in Search Discovery. But they merged together. The publicist is a whole is a is a large umbrella company with a lot of smaller holding companies, and it has over the course of time began consolidating them together. So Razorfish, which was a separate agency in its own right, which used to be a competitor to Rosetta, um, was owned by Publicis, and they merged us, and we became Razorfish. And over the course of time, um, slowly but surely, things started changing. Things started changing from very high above, and, and there was a trickle-down effect, and people started leaving. Slowly but surely, slowly but surely, but continually. Um, and I ended up being there for six years. And I would say this started at about three and a half to four years into it. And um, there was a slow trickle of really, really, really good people and really talented people out the door to other places. Um, one of those places ended up being search discovery, right? Um, anyhow, for me, um, that sucked. It sucked to see, but at the same time, it was an opportunity because there was a there was a log jam of talent there, and not to say that like, you know, once those people left, that there wasn't still talent there. Um, but when I say a log jam, I mean kind of in the upper um, management 
level, director level in the SEO department specifically, there was a bit of a log jam. And that log jam over the course of time, because people left, took other opportunities, cleared out. And um, I think it cleared out both to my benefit and to the detriment uh, uh, in some other ways, right? Um, and after a while, unfortunately, um, you know, my boss, Steve Pitts, who I want to give a shout out to, he's definitely one of my mentors. He was running the whole practice, but he was so busy, so busy that he just didn't have time to to do everything, to babysit every everything. And I said, Steve, I want to step up and um, I'm willing to drive up to Cleveland twice a week because in Cleveland um, specifically, now there were a lot of branch offices in Chicago and New York and Atlanta and so on and so forth. But in Cleveland specifically, um, there had been a, a, a bit of an exodus and there weren't any more manager and director level people there. They were just gone. And I was the only one except for Steve um, close, close by. So I said, Steve, I'm going to drive up twice a week um, and uh, I'm going to take a more hands-on approach with the um, with the team. And from there, started, um, started setting up one-on-ones with everybody um, on the team. And um, we started, uh, you know, a training program because what had happened was like when people leave, like you can't just replace talent. And experience, more so experience overnight. The group that we had left was junior and was talented, but they just didn't have the experience and they had not yet been battle tested, so to speak. Um, hate to use war analogies, but tested. Uh, and therefore, there was a gap, right? And and there was a gap of time where it was a real risk for the, for the company um, because there was an experience gap. Um, so I did my best to um, get training started and to begin exposing the team to new ideas and new ways of thinking about things. And um, I would say for me, it ended up being the most rewarding time in my career to date. Um, and granted, I love my job now. Um, I love I love being at Search Discovery, but um, I think that maybe what ended up happening towards the end at Razorfish, which became Sapient Razorfish, which is now Publicis Sapient, um, for me, it was almost like magic, right? And and um, that's the reason why a lot of those folks, even the, even some of them who are still my competitors, um, are coming on my podcast, those former colleagues, because we all, and I think that if you talk to them separately, they'll agree that our small little unit uh, of a team the little engine that could develop such a strong bond with each other um, and camaraderie with each other that it became more than just typical work colleagues. And before that, before that point in time, like people were nice and I liked the people that I work with, but and we were close, but we weren't that close. And um, we got to a point where we were so close, so close that we were like family. Um, at the end and we were really doing some great things and for me um, you know I don't want to say it because I don't want to sound conceited but Steve was Steve was the lead but I I felt like I became the de facto leader the leader the the person behind it all the the energy um, and and I felt like the team really responded to me and it was incredibly rewarding um, and uh, watching those people grow and develop, some of whom I still work with today, some of which I don't work with anymore. Um, it was amazing and it was the most rewarding and to watch them continue on. And now those people that, that have moved on to other places, they're in the leadership positions. And to know that I had something to do with that is, there, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever be able to replicate it because it was just so rewarding. Um, and, and that's why helping people out to me is important to me. It's an, an important part of my career. And okay, for me, the reason I left, um, and it was a hard, hard decision to eventually leave Razorfish, Sapient Razorfish, was uh, eventually the travel. Um, that's hard on your family, right? Um, uh, two hours per week back and forth to Cleveland every week, um, leaving at 5.30 in the morning to get to the office by 8, leaving the office by 4, and sometimes five, sometimes later, getting back at seven or eight at night. Um, that was hard because by that point in time, my wife and I had had a second second child, right? It was incredibly hard on me. It was incredibly hard on my family and it became unsustainable um, over time, even though how much 
even with how much I love the team. Um, and then I would say like the slow trickle out had a, had an effect on morale and there, you know, there was some bureaucracy and, and just not being able to feel like we could change anything as a group from based on what was coming down from above was really difficult. So the circumstances were just ripe for leaving. And at about that time, I was approached by somebody named Will Schroeder, who is a pretty well respected entrepreneur. He had approached me before and it just, you know, it never worked out. Um, and then he approached me again and he just caught me at the right time. Um, and uh, uh, his company, startups.co, which is now startups.com, is a company that helps other startups get off the ground. And their founders, Will, um, Ryan Rutan, Elliot uh, Schneer, I believe is how you pronounce his name. I never could pronounce his name right. Um, are a group of founders that came together to build a company uh, and they pulled together their wealth of experience and knowledge at building startups. They've each exited um, exited several companies themselves um, and sold off several companies themselves after building them up from scratch. Um, they started a company to help other companies get off the ground and what they um, were really good at was uh, teaching other people how to do it. What they were not so great at was SEO. And Will came to me and said, hey, this is a huge blind spot for us. And um, uh, honestly, we need your help. Um, and I said, oh, okay. And honestly, for me, their office was 10 minutes from my house. <laughs> that beats driving to Cleveland right every day of the week. My wife loved that idea. Um, and uh, they wanted to pay me more money, right? It's not all about the money, but when somebody is 10 minutes from your house and they want to pay you more money, Pretty hard to turn it down. So I went to work at startups.co and then something happened that I did not expect. Um, and I knew it on my first day. I knew it. Um, I was just not a fit. I was not a fit culturally. And it's not to say that there's anything wrong with those people. They're great people. And they do have um, a good, very unique culture over there. Um, but it was for me the second time that I've been in house and the second time that I I just, I just didn't fit and I didn't enjoy it. Um, and what I will say is I enjoyed my work. My work um, was awesome. It was one of the first times where I was completely unleashed to do everything that I wanted to do from an SEO perspective and test anything that I wanted to test. If I wanted to change content, I could go into the CML, CMS and change the content myself. If I wanted to write an article, I could do it myself um, in two seconds. Whereas, you know, when you're at an agency, you know, you make recommendations and they sometimes sit for months or you have to build a presentation about your recommendations uh, and that takes up your time. And sometimes it's really hard to get things implemented. Well, that was not a problem at startups.co, not even a little bit. Um, so I went there and I was like, all right, you know what? This is going to turn around, right? Once people get to know me, this will turn around. Um, and I was optimistic and then it didn't and then it didn't. And then for me, it became a thing, right? It became like being um, being a kid sitting at the end of the lunch table and nobody else wants to sit by you. Um, and over time, instead of getting up, because I have great social anxiety, especially within, um, within groups, um, it got hard for me to, and I, and I tried a few times to seek out friendships and um, to seek, seek out relationships and it just didn't work, right? It was like a square peg in a round hole, but we did great work. Um, if, if, and I was just looking at it the other day. Um, if you look at their traffic, um, not that you're going to be looking at it, not that you have access to their analytics, uh, from my first year to my second year, we increased traffic. Uh, if you look at 2018 versus 2017, I was there for a year and a half. 2018 was a 90% traffic increase to their website. So I did my job got them more traffic, um, they, launched a, they launched a product and they started charging money for it. And now they've launched startup, startups.com uh, and they've put together a lot of really great coursework and so on and so forth. But, un, un, in, but unfortunately, I just couldn't stay, right? Um, you know, there were, a couple of, there were a couple of defining moments and one was, I, you know, I went on vacation and I came back and um, nobody asked me <laughs> Nobody asked me how I was doing or how my vacation was, and I realized that nobody knew I was, I was, I was gone. And uh, you know, I, I also think that um, the relationship that I had had with the team at Rosetta was such a once in a lifetime 
you know, sort of relationship and camaraderie that when I went to another place, and it could have been anywhere, I think, and didn't experience that, I have no other way to describe it, but it was like somebody died. It was like a, it was like a part of me died. And um, honestly, I went into, I went into for a while a depression. And it got to the point where I love my job, but I didn't want to go to work because I had anxiety uh, about fitting in. Um, and and uh, I was depressed for a long time. And it took me a long time to recognize because I'd, I've never felt depressed before. I felt depression in short bursts, especially as it relates to things around my childhood. And I've struggled through that, but I've never felt a prolonged depression and not wanting to eat and not wanting to get up and go to work. Um, and there was just a, it, the longer it went on, the more and more I realized that I this it's unsustainable. It was like the travel to Cleveland. It's unsustainable for me. So, um, you know, one day I finally, it and it took a lot of courage for me to admit it to myself that I was depressed and it took a lot of courage to admit it to my wife. Um, probably three or four months, I was trying to think, how do I tell my wife? Because I just started this job. I, wa I was only a year and a half into it. Give it more time. Give it more time. Um, and I knew early on. I knew it. I knew early on. I knew in my gut, something's not right here. And I just let it sit. And I didn't do anything about it. I hoped it would get better. And it didn't. And it didn't. And I began to despair more and more and more about it. And um, it took a while. And I guess the, the advice, if you recognize that you're depressed early on, and I'm not an expert, but I would say like, deal with it. Don't bury your head in the sand. Um, and I did for a while. And uh, it didn't do me any good. It didn't magically get any better. And finally, I remember um, one day I got up and I was standing in the shower my wife was getting ready and we're getting ready to go to work and finally I just said it I said Gina I'm I'm depressed I I don't like my job I don't think I can work there anymore um what do I do and um you know I was I was afraid to admit that because I had just changed jobs and I didn't want her and my family to have to go through me changing jobs again to potentially uh potentially um you know, who knows? Who knows what other job was out there? Um, and luckily, I had been kind of keeping my eye on keeping my eye on things. So I knew then we talked and we said, OK, let's make a plan. So I made a plan, got my resume together and I said, all right, I have a bunch of contacts uh, at former companies. I have a good working relationship. I have a good reputation. Um, and I knew that a couple of my um, a couple of my people had gone on to other places, one of those places being Search Discovery. I even reconnected with the folks back at Sapient Razorfish, Publicist Sapient, and, and looked into, like, what would it take for me to boomerang and go back there? Uh, looked at a company called Brand Muscle. Um, and I basically, I put together a plan. And then one day, and that was a Thursday or a Wednesday, I think it was a Wednesday. I canvassed all of my all of my close connections within those companies, and I reached out to them um, through LinkedIn or through Facebook or through however I was connected with them. Reached out to them uh, and said, "Hey guys, th this is just not working out for me. Um, do you have any availability?" That was at ten in the morning, and two hours later, in my boss Tim Truss, great guy, called me. <laughs> Because he had my phone number, because we had a good relationship before and we had worked together on a few accounts. I, I was shocked, completely, completely shocked. Called me on the phone within two hours, didn't even respond back on LinkedIn, just straight up called me. And um, we started talking and I kind of explained, I explained my situation and I was very honest and very, you know, very open. And uh, he said, okay, let me go back. I'm gonna figure something out. And that's not Tim's voice, but that's, I guess, how I how I managed managed it. You're lucky. This is the right time. Um, we we have it. We have a job opening, and uh, oh man, the timing. And that's why I say fate, fate, fate put me there at that moment. If I had waited three more days, or if I had reached out three days earlier, there would have been nothing. I just so happened to reach out almost on the day that the rec hiring rep came out at Search Discovery. 
And uh, Tim called me the next day. We talked again. And he said, I want to get you on the phone. I want to get you on the phone with a couple of the people here. Um, one of them was the first person that I interviewed with or that they interviewed uh, on my podcast, Zach Chahalas. Another one was Wade Saunders, who I work with, who will, I think, at some point be in a future interview. And uh, so I got off the phone with Tim. And within five minutes, I'm interviewing with Zach, completely unprepared. We finish our interview. Within five minutes of that, I'm interviewing with Wade, completely unprepared. But they, um, Tim knew me, and uh, he knew me. And, uh, you know, I was, I was lucky. I was very, very lucky to land at Search Discovery. Um, and, and I would say search discovery has been a great place for me and, um, nobody's paying, I mean, they're paying me, but they're not paying me to say this. Um, it is a really, really awesome company and there are some really, really smart people. And, um, what I will say about search discovery is it was the second time in my career where I was like people, like these people understand me, they get me, they get me to the core and I work remote. At search discovery I've I don't travel as much as I used to but I feel a closer connection with the team at search discovery um, than I than I did it at, at the last job and that that's made all the difference for me and I'm very uh, very happy with uh, with the choice and I don't plan to go anywhere right um, if you're a business and you want a good SEO come to search discovery right we'll do some good work for you um, so that's my that's my very, very long-winded story. Um, I do want to talk about a, a few things, um, a few other topics um, before I go. In-house versus agency, right? So I've been in an agency and I've been in-house and um, I think it kind of depends on, on the person, right? Um, it depends on your own work style in terms of which is a better fit for you. For me, it's agency. Um, and agency life can be crazy and there are certain things about what I call agency world that are crazy like bouncing around from uh, from site to site from industry to industry from vertical to vertical um, you know having to account for all of your hours down to a T or having BD crop up out of nowhere and kind of the hair on fire exercises a um, lot of things about agencies that drive me up a wall but at the same time I find that agencies can sometimes, um, in my experience, with the exception of some of my work at startups where I just had a higher level of access, um, the way that agencies sometimes think about it are just more cutting edge and more, um, more, I don't know, right on the, right on the edge of, of how things are breaking, whether it gets implemented or not. Um, you know, if you've got a good agency, they're typically thinking 10 steps ahead and, um, and really, I, I would hope, challenging challenging their clients. Now, what I would say about in-house is um, the cool thing about in-house was in one of the things that I got burnt out with in agency life was um, the constant bouncing around and not just being able to focus in on any one brand or any one website. And when I got to startups, it was really, really cool to just be able to spend almost all of my time focusing on one website. And I got a lot of work done. And, uh, and I learned a lot and, um, you know, it was really, really awesome not to have to divide my attention, but I would say at the same time, it became kind of monotonous. Um, and I got bored, uh, I got bored with it. Right. Um, I love my job and I love my work, but like, yeah, we had that one, um, pretty well set up to keep growing. So, um, for me, agency world is, is what keeps me fresh keeps me challenged. I've been in-house twice and I haven't liked it. Um, unless the perfect in-house opportunity comes around, I just don't foresee myself going back in-house. Um, failures. I want to talk about failures. Um, boy, I had one, I had one today. Um, and it's in, and it's important to know that even like, okay, I'm like 13 or 13, what is it? 2019. I am 13 years into my SEO career and I'm still having failures, right? It happens. It happens to everybody. Um, and the one that I will say today, and, and unfortunately I can't say the name, although if they if they listen, they'll know it's them, is that um, I'm working with a working with a company, and I was doing a a presentation yesterday. Um, and for this company, we are achieving some really really great results. So I was really excited to present that, and I was really happy to present that. But when I shared my screen, I had a certain tab open um, and it wasn't like a dirty or anything bad or anything like that, but they read, they noticed my tab 
Um, and, they, and it was it's one of those situations where you're working with a client, but you're not using their product. And they noticed that. And um, it was really embarrassing. And they, they definitely called me out. And um, I'm definitely, honestly, I'm feeling pretty embarrassed about it. And I am now using their product. But um, it was definitely a, it was definitely a fail and not a not a good look and something I'm looking uh, forward to making up for. Um, the other one, which I shared a little bit during um, during my interview with Margie, was we were working on a client. And uh, this is very important, right? In agency world, um, you know, you're constantly talking back and forth amongst yourselves. And I'm sure that the clients do this too. <laughs> it's just normal, just normal human behavior to eventually have things if you're working with someone long enough to have things that rub you the wrong way or that irritate you and it's normal to go that that fucking client or those idiots or whatever and um, that happens that happens that happens probably at any job and that happens at agencies um, and sometimes it, it's almost um, it's like if you've seen the Big Bang Theory I love that show by the way the episode where Amy Fer where where Penny and Bernadette get into an argument about their job and and Amy Farrah Fowler is kind of in the middle and then she realizes that um, talking bad about a third party can actually be a powerful bonding experience and I would say that that's that's true not doesn't make it right doesn't make it good but it happens and um, so Margie and I shared this experience because over the course of time um, the client was it was educated on how to do something and had continually despite being educated had not done what we asked and eventually it became irritating and it wasn't a big thing it was just as simple as who to go to for what sort of thing um, and they would continually go to the wrong person and uh, finally and we had talked about it and laughed about it and cursed about it a few times and then finally um, client sent us an email, sent it to the wrong person. I wasn't on the email originally. And uh, Margie sent it to me. And there was a, a kind of a snarky comment in there. Uh, and it wasn't bad. It wasn't like cussing or cursing or, or anything about the client. But it was like, please. it was something to the effect of like, hey, please don't bite her head off. But we need to respond to this. And um, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. And, and this was completely my fault. I added myself to the email, I responded in a very professional way, um, said, yeah, glad to help you with this, glad to help you with this. But what I forgot to do was take out the part where we had talked directly to the to and about the client and um, sent it over. And uh, I would say within three seconds of hitting send, I knew. Oh shit. <laughs> I knew. I knew, man. I was like, oh, you can't and you can't get it back. And you're like, you're trying to catch it before it gets out of the inbox, and that's not even possible. And it was too late. Of course the client saw it. And um, I knew, and I was shaking. Margie was shaking. Um, we were shaking in our boots. And the only one that wasn't shaking, uh, the man who at that point in time who had just been promoted. I called immediately Brian Dean, not that Brian Dean, not the SEO Brian Dean, but the Brian Dean that I know who works for Search Discovery, who I've said many times is amazing. I called him and said, my first words were, Brian, am I going to be fired? And he said, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out. And that's, that's Brian, man. Brian is, even in the most dire circumstances like that, like he is the one that can keep it real and and keep things at an even keel. And he's really good at building client relationships and he's great at servicing clients. And um, you know, he was able to smooth it over. And and I I apologize profusely to the client many, many times over. I and I still feel bad for doing that. And I wished I had never done it. It taught me an important lesson though, which is it's okay to maybe say some of those things. It's okay to think some of those things. Don't commit it to paper. Don't commit it to Slack. Don't commit it to Instant Messenger. Um, don't write that email if you're mad at a client or you're mad at a at a work at, at an employee. If you're mad, if you're frustrated, walk away. Don't hit send. Herm Edwards always says it. Don't hit send. Um, and I've learned that. Like okay, even if I think that, don't say anything on paper that you wouldn't say to that person or that party in person. That's a, a super valuable lesson that I learned. 
um, successes. I've had a few. Uh, by the way, I love Frank Sinatra, one of my favorite uh, favorite musicians. Frank Sinatra, I'm kind of an old um, uh, an older music lover at heart, which makes me really really weird. Um, anyways, um, a couple of things. Uh, one. I, I thought that the, despite the fact that um, I didn't enjoy my time at startups, the fact that we were able to grow traffic so tremendously was a tremendous success. And, and given that I was the only one doing SEO, now granted there were other people involved, right? There were content writers and content managers um, and my boss, Ryan, and so on and so forth. But um, it was my strategy and it was really cool to um, to watch things take effect, to test things and to watch them grow and the way that they sold me internally, not me, sold me, but sold me to the team was that I was going to bring in mountains of traffic, so they said in one of their emails. And I that that in of in and of itself is really intimidating because as an SEO you can't promise anybody anything. Um, but suffice it to say I was able to bring in a lot more traffic for them. Um, The other one that jumps out at my mind in terms of successes was um, a a client a few years back. uh, And I'll say I'll say the client name now because, again, it's far enough away. I enjoyed working with them and we had a good relationship. Hickory Farms. Hickory Farms was a really cool client to work on, but they have a really unique business model. And uh, their business model is this. They make 90 percent of their revenue in two months. And those two months are November and December. So their entire year is geared around those two months and everything leads up to those two months and um, we had been working with Hickory Farms. I had not. I was not on the account. I was busy with Nationwide um, for for several years and what would happen is they would hire us beginning in September and then at the end of December they would let us go and every single year we'd have to start over again, right? And uh, you know, if you know SEO, SEO just doesn't work like that, right? It just doesn't work and every year we told them like, hey, Every single year, we're having to rebuild the dam for your results, and it's and it's a giant waste of resources and energy and time. And if we could just work with you year round, you know, in the dark months, January through October, um, we could be building things up so that when you reach peak season in November and December, the pump is primed, right? We don't have to spend time priming it. And, uh, you know, what had happened, you know, when we worked with them in September is we'll build things up. But by the time things build up, it's too late. Right. And uh, and it's too late. It's too late. The season's over by the time you, you know, you get to your best ranking results. And um, for many years in a row, they said, thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. And then finally, I was able to get onto the the account and um, I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was about my my message. Um, or, or how I positioned it maybe differently than other people, but finally they started believing. And we had one good year, and then we were finally able to get them to buy into the year-round program. Um, and, it, and it ended up being really good. We, we stacked together several really good years for them in terms of, um, in terms of performance. And for me personally, it, that effort, in addition to, to you know, my reputation and my other work, helped me get promoted um, at Razorfish at the time to director level again. So that was, um, you know, that was, that was awesome. That was a success for me. Um, a few other things about, I want to talk about mentors. Um, Steve Pitts, who I've talked about a little bit was uh, my boss. I want to give him a huge shout out. He is now at budget dumpster, um, which is a weird enough thing. A lot of people who left Rosetta and Razorfish, they went to one of three places, search discovery, Brand Muscle or Budget Dumpster of all <laughs> of all places. It's kind of weird, but they're they're building up a huge team and they are taking over the world one dumpster at a time. But Steve specifically really um, he was one of the people that really helped me become kind of comfortable in my skin as an SEO and comfortable with dealing with clients, especially big name clients. Right, um, watching him go in and be so confident in delivering his recommendations and his strategy to clients was something to behold um, and something that rubbed off on on me, I would say. And, um, you know, I'm I'm forever grateful. And I I will never forget the day that I finally had to had to go in and put in my notice. Um, Steve was the was the one he was the first one that I told. And uh, honestly, I, I sat in his office 
uh, and I bawled. I bawled my eyes out. I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I cried, and I and he was, um, you know, almost like a like a a bit of a father figure with respect to um, to that professionally. And uh, you know, he let me know, hey man, it's okay, man. You got to do what you got to do. You got to think about your family. And uh, he was really great, and uh, really great. Um, I've talked about Brian Dean before. Brian Brian's not an SEO, um, although he knows surprisingly a lot about SEO strategy because he's been dealing with it um, for twenty plus twenty plus years in 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 some way, shape, or form. But Brian, like I said, man, he has been um, he has been really good for me again in in terms of helping me develop my confidence and um, really come into my own in terms of knowing like, hey, I do know what I'm talking about. Uh, in handling clients and being calm and being kind of that presence and being a thought leader and pushing me all at the same time and helping me. He's helped me a lot. He was my career manager um, throughout a lot of my time at Rosetta and Razorfish, and he really helped me um, to get where I am today. And uh, he was one of those people that when I left there, I was like, man, am I, I'm never going to talk to him again. That sucks. And um, he was one of the reasons that I wanted to come to search discovery because I just wanted to work with people like him again. Uh, and then the last one, um, I would say is, uh, Matt Saunders. I, I, I don't think Matt Saunders is, is super well known, but I would say pound for pound. He's the best SEO that I've ever worked with. Right. He, um, he, he was there at the beginning when I first started working at Rosetta and it was almost like, he was Neo and I was going into the matrix and, and he's the one that helped me take the blue pill to see how far the rabbit hole would go. And he introduced me to, you know, so many new ways of managing an SEO strategy, being accountable, uh, running an SEO strategy for a really, really large, you know, business, uh, an enterprise, um, and just watching him go about it and watching him challenge both himself and in me. Um, and pushing me and managing the team, he he just to watch him work um, was a real eye opener for me at that point in my career to really realize, no man, you haven't made it. Uh, and not only was Matt younger than me, he was better than me, and that was a tough pill um, to swallow. As much as I loved him, to know that yeah, there's there are, there are people out there that that are just better. Uh, and he was somebody that was really influential in terms of uh, just watching and pushing me to be better at my job. A um, couple of other things. I do want to talk about the conference circuit, right? So there was a big kerfuffle yesterday um, in the conference circuit, specifically around Yoast Khan. Apparently, um, apparently there's been some uh, some old sexual harassment stuff that had been um, that had been brought up, and I don't necessarily like want to dive into that. I'm no expert, right? Um, I'm sensitive to it, and I um, I would never treat a woman that way. But at the same time, there seem to be so many opinions coming out as to where and how, as a man, um, you, you know, you should be in terms of standing up for for women um, and standing up for equality within the industry that it's really hard to, and honestly, to know how to act other than to be supportive, um, supportive of women. And, and uh, you know, that's something that I've seen um, over my course of time and something that I, like personally I'm not okay with, it, uh, aside from the sexual harassment component, which seems to be happening everywhere and it's disgusting and despicable. And I can't imagine treating anybody that way anybody that way right it's um i think it's only natural to be attracted but to to do that type of stuff to anybody it's just not right it's just not right as a as a human as a human being and um the other thing that i think is not right i I don't think this one is quite as insidious but i think it's a problem is everywhere that i've been especially in leadership positions managers directors it's been mostly men Mostly men. In fact, I don't. I only remember a handful of women um, being in a leadership position, and for me, like that's that's just wrong, right? Uh, and I and I think it's been really nice to see you know more women kind of um, speaking out and saying no, this this is not okay. Um, and uh, and you know, women are just as smart as men, and not only that, in many cases, because of the different way that they think of, think about things, just by being a woman. They're better, and they're better, and they think about pe- they they think about people, 
and they think about things in a much different way sometimes than than men. And at minimum, there should be more women in leadership positions within SEO, at minimum. Um, and I'm glad to see that that rising, but I think we still have a ways to go. And I'm not saying like go balance out the ratio just for the sake of hiring women, right? People have to earn it. But at the same time, I, I would... I strongly believe that there are probably women who are in lower positions that have earned it that are just not in the higher position because they're a woman, right? Um, so that's stupid. So I, I honestly would like to see more diversity um, within leadership in, in SEO. And that brings me to conferences. And um, I don't speak at conferences very much for uh, for a number of reasons. One, I have, I have social anxiety, right? Um, not social anxiety when I get one-on-one or not when I'm sitting in my office talking for an hour doing a podcast, but social anxiety in the sense that when I get in a large group of people, I freeze up. I don't know what to do. And um, with, with things like singing, I'm shocked that I can get out in front of people and sing. But when it comes to like a mixer, right, or... or or just a big gathering of people, it's hard for me to know how to interact. So speaking has not been something that's been natural, despite the fact that I do feel like I, I have things to say and have things to share and have expertise to to share, but I'm just more comfortable in sharing that in a one-off fashion and um, not at conferences. Not that I don't think um, some of the things that come out at conferences aren't great. Um, certainly there's some amazing people that, that speak um, and there's some amazing thought leadership that comes out. But the other thing uh, about conferences is, um, you know, I have pet pee- I have some pet peeves, and I, I think sometimes what comes out of the what I'll call the conference circuit is a little bit like um, theoretical physics versus being an engineer. And what I mean by that is um, not everything, but some of the stuff you hear at conferences is very pie in the sky and hard for me, at least me, to relate to. Um, and I, I know that in this doesn't, I don't want to speak for the entire conference circuit as far as SEOs go, but for me, <clears throat> for me, I've had, um, I've had a bad experience with a few people that are well known on the conference circuit and not a bad experience in the sense of like they did something directly wrong to me, but a bad experience in that they were people that were giving other people advice and speaking regularly. And honestly, um, one that I'm thinking of now was in a position of great power and authority and respect. And I've heard so many stories about that person walking around like a freaking rock star at these conferences. But when I worked with them on certain accounts and they were actually forced to do actual work with actual clients, they were clueless, just as clueless as as you're the most junior resource. And it just, the couple of times that this has happened, with the people that it's happened with has just made me really kind of shy away from the SEO conference industry for that very reason alone, because there are times when I just, whether it's right or not, have doubts with some of the people in terms of can, if when push comes to shove, can they do the actual work that they talk about theoretically? So that's my thing on um, on conferences. I, I also... Um, I suffer from imposter syndrome a little bit too, so that that is part of the reason why I don't necessarily get up and speak all the time. Is there's a, a certain level of fear that that I'm going to be outed as, hey, he's not interesting or he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I think that that's normal and that's something that I'm that I'm working on getting over. And I would also say that my other pet peeve on conferences is that it's um, I really I really get annoyed with like the top. Um, top SEOs list. There was a top 140 list. Well, there are some really great SEOs that aren't on that list that nobody knows about. And I get annoyed when people name drop like, hey, I just talked to John or I just talked to Gary or hey, me and me and Danny Sullivan just went and got a drink. And maybe you are friends with those people. Um, I was at a conference recently and I forget who did it, but I knew exactly who they were talking about. My good friend, Neil. He didn't say the last name, but he's talking about Neil Patel. Um, and I was like, oh, great, you just name dropped. And so I hate name dropping. I hate the kind of hero worship that goes on. I'm not just, I'm not into that. I'm not somebody that's impressed with celebrities, um, so on and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, it's just never been, never been my thing. Now, maybe someday, like, okay, obviously I'm doing a podcast, like part of everybody probably wants to be famous. I want this podcast to be successful, 
right? But at the same time, I'm I'm um, I'm not somebody who sometimes I don't I don't take success well in the sense that like I have hard time with comp- compliments, um, and I, I'm not looking to be in the in the spotlight really. So it's doing something like this and speaking at a at a conference. It's a little bit counterintuitive, right? So maybe I'll speak at a conference in the future. Maybe if my podcast takes off, I'll get famous, Twitter famous, SEO famous, whatever. And I don't know how I'll deal with that at the time. I just know that I'm apprehensive. Um, one last thing. I do want to share uh, another story about office politics and um, in my experience, um, promotions. Um, you know, if you work at an agency, there are some places that you can be where it's a little bit cutthroat, cutthroat. Um, completely cutthroat and uh, you're not just competing with other people and that you're doing your job you, you know for your clients on behalf of your clients you're competing with your peers internally to get ahead and get a promotion and that culture was pretty pervasive um, and uh, you know again I don't want to talk bad about the the Rosetta legacy but I think anybody that worked there knows that that culture was pretty um, pretty pervasive and uh, it, it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way it is what it is um, Eventually, I got promoted, but I do have, um, I did have one of my one promotion story for me that um, it didn't work out so well, and I learned a lot from it. But um, you know, I was in a situation where I was doing a lot of the work, but I wasn't because I was in Columbus and not in Cleveland. Um, you know, directly with the team, I wasn't in a position to let everybody know that I was doing a lot of the work. And I saw somebody, and I love this person, but um, somebody was promoted ahead of me when I felt like I should have been the one to get the, um, to get the promotion. <laughs> and, uh, it sucked, it hurt. And it, and it, and it made me envy that person a little bit. And it made me mad at that person in a little bit. And it made me realize maybe that person's not my, not my friend. Um, and eventually like I, I came to realize that there were reasons that I, that that person was getting promoted and, and that I wasn't at the time. And I guess the advice that I would give is f- for people that are, looking to, to, to get promoted. Every, I mean, I'm sure everybody is. Um, one, keep your head up. Keep working hard. Keep doing good work. Keep um, making your clients look good and making your, your teammates' lives easier. But at the same time, in a competitive environment, you need to realize that perception is reality. That's very important. Perception is reality. So if, if the perception was, for me, that that other person was leading the charge more so than I was, even though I was doing a lot of the work, that was the reality. And that person got promoted and I didn't. And I had to wait uh, probably a year and a half longer than I should have, which cost me money. Cost me money, cost me prestige, so on and so forth. And it sucked. Um, and, and some of the reasons given to me at the time sucked. Um, and it was, you know, kind of making up reasons to, um, to, to, to not promote me and it, and it, and it, all I could say is it sucked. And, uh, you know, I fought through it and and eventually got promoted. But, um, what I would say again is you, you've got to persevere, but you do have to realize, um, what the environment is going to be like and what people are thinking around you. Um, if you want to get promoted, right. And, and you have to show that you're working at the next level, right working at the next level um, before you can actually get promoted, which is kind of weird, right? (laughs) Kind of weird that you already have to be working at the next level. Um, Favorite SEO tactic. Uh, I want to kind of close this thing out because I'm running longer than any episode that I've ever done. Favorite SEO tactic is, uh, I've been branded as a technical SEO, but I, I effing love content. Um, And I think most people get content wrong. So I'll say the content audit. And the reason I think most people get content wrong is because there's a process, right, that people go through. And I don't think people are as strategic as they think they are with content. And many people have this idea that SEO can happen at the end of the process, right? So you you, you maybe do your keyword research. A lot of times you don't. You have no idea. You just create this piece of content and then you take it to your SEO and they sprinkle their magic fairy dust on it and it's magically going to rank. Well, no, not how SEO works. Uh, The real magic is in the research at the front of the process that informs the article that says, hey, here are all the things that you could talk about. Here's what you should talk about. Here's what your customers are talking about. Here's in what volume. And by the way, people forget when they're trying to write a piece of content 
and trying to rank it, nobody looks at the, the at the search results. Nobody looks at the search results. And and it's and it's always like this big eye opener like, "Oh my gosh, I have to look at that. I can't just develop a piece of content." Google is giving you the answer to what type of a piece of content to write. They're giving you the answer. The sites that are showing up prominently are are the answer. That's the answer to the test. And what you need to do if you're trying to beat them is you need to go and figure out what they've done. You need to figure out if you're trying to rank for topic X, how are other articles approaching it? Go look at their pages. Go look at how much content they have in terms of things like word, excuse me, word count. Look at their titles. Look at their meta. Look at their on-page content. What subtopics are they hitting on? Um, you know what? It, you know what types of um, you know digital media and, and assets are they pulling in? Um, you know how much depth are they covering? Uh, you know on a topic and with what expertise? Um, you know what are they doing? Basically, reverse engineering what every one of the sites that is ranking well is doing and taking that information and using it to your advantage to at minimum minimum be on par with what they're doing and then once you're on par mind that you shouldn't copy their content but once you're on par with what they're doing and taking a similar approach then taking it a little bit farther and putting your unique spin on it uh and your unique value proposition and that for me has been incredibly incredibly successful at driving rankings and driving traffic favorite seo tools said it before and I'll, I'll say it again, right? Um, Ahrefs is my favorite SEO tool. Uh, and I hope to someday have um, Tim Sulo on and maybe he'll remember this story and maybe he won't. But uh, Ahrefs wasn't always as good as it, as it is today. Um, and don't get me wrong, I like other tools. I like SEMrush. You know, when I was at Rosetta, we used Bright Edge and I liked Bright Edge, but unfortunately it just can't hold a candle in my mind to, to Ahrefs. And there's other good rank tracking tools. Moz is okay. Uh, you know, stat is really good. There's really great technical tools. I love my screaming frog. I love deep crawl. I love, uh, you know, the various, I love web page test, GT metrics to test site speed. Uh, I love lighthouse. Um, site bulb is, is something that I've tried and that I've liked so far. There are plenty of good tools. Uh, SEO radar, great for monitoring. I love what they're doing with, uh, what Google's doing with Google search console, but none of it holds a candle to me to Ahrefs. And uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article on my blog. You could probably still find it. Uh, uh, 50 SEO tools, the best SEO tools. Tim, using Ahrefs, I would assume, uh, and the alerts that that tool allows, found my article. And I had written a not nice thing based on um, an experience that I had had with their tool in the past in which it was more like Majestic. Uh, It was more like... Uh, a watered down version of Majestic, which is uh, a great resource for links. And um, they had made some improvements in the meantime since I had last um, last used the tool, but I had listed it in my list and I had said, eh, this tool's okay, not that great, but it's a tool and uh, you should check it out, right? And he emailed me and this is a this is a great way to get links back, by the way. He emailed me and I said, hey, and he said, hey, I think you'll... I'm going to give you a free trial, but I think that you'll, once you log in, see that it's more than what you're saying. And maybe if you agree with me, you'll go back and change your description. And once I logged in, right, I was wrong, man. I was so wrong, so wrong. And they, they, they have progressed so much in terms of the quality of their tool and the analysis ability to, that it gives you the comprehensive analysis, right? You can do technical SEO. You can do content strategy with their tool. You can set up alerts. Um, There's a lot that you can do with their tool in terms of breaking down data. You can track rankings. You can do a batch analysis of links. uh, You can do a content um, gap analysis, uh, page level analysis. You can do analysis uh, cutting the data by site section. Uh, It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, And what I like about them is they iterate so freaking quickly, and it's funny that I'm I'm reading uh, Rand Fishkin's book still, been reading it forever, finally coming to the end. But one of the things that he talked about in his book is the problem with Moz's development cycle and how they used to be cutting edge and top of the line uh, five or six years ago, and how companies like Ahrefs, who were not as big as they were, but were more nimble and more 
easily able to adapt, have caught up with, and in some cases surpassed. And Ahrefs is definitely, in my mind, surpassed um, their capabilities. And I think Moss is now struggling to catch up. But that's neither here nor there. Um, Ahrefs is my favorite tool. Uh, and uh, if they want to pay me to spot Ahrefs, if you're listening and you want to pay me to sponsor it, gladly will do so. Um, my best advice for new SEOs, if you're getting into SEO, and uh, you know it's brand new to you, what I would say is one, you're not gonna learn SEO in college, right? They just don't teach it yet. Um, they're not there. You'll learn marketing, but I've yet to see the person come out of college with a marketing degree ready to hit the ground running with SEO. In fact, many people get into it by accident. I got into it by accident. I wasn't looking to be an SEO. I wanted to be a graphic designer. Um, I find that those people tend to do better. But if you're getting into SEO, whether it's by accident or you're coming out of college, um, be a sponge. If you have the time, read, read, read. Um, It's a lot different than it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago when there weren't as many resources available online. Uh, We're in a golden age of content production. There's so much good content out there, um, whether it be... Uh, on on actual web pages, whether it be advice on Twitter, go to conferences. While you're early in your career, take up the time to just soak it all in and learn as much as you can. And um, the other thing I would say is build a website, right? Um, Not everybody comes from a technical background, but when you're an SEO, you kind of need to be able to play in all spaces. And when you're you're analyzing a website, kind of hard to be able to tell other people what to do when you don't know what to do. Um, It would be like being a a mechanic, but not knowing how an engine works, right? I'm not gonna trust you to give me advice on my car. Um, And the same goes with an SEO. I I strongly feel that um, it's really valuable for you uh, to learn how to build a website. And I also feel like it's really valuable for you to have your own personal site. I have my own personal site. Um, everybody should have their own personal site. It doesn't have to be about SEO. It can be about anything. Um, but there's there's a real value from a personal branding standpoint, and there's real value uh, in the ability to get in there and get in the nuts and the bolts and understand how it all works and test things and mess around and uh, just see where things go. So, so that's my advice. Um, okay, I'm at two hours almost. This is the longest by far episode of the page two podcast i hope you stick around i hope you found my story um really valuable and if you're still listening man i thank you and thank you for supporting the the podcast please subscribe um thank you and uh here's to many more episodes